This is Democracy Here. My name is Mary Ellen Calderwood, and my guest today is Suzanne Love. Suzanne is a nurse and a member of the Massachusetts Nurses Association. Today we're talking about ballot question one, safe patient limits, which the voters of Massachusetts will decide in November, and which is a topic of interest to Franklin County I'm continuing the political revolution. Good worker, good news to you all tell of how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? My mother is a feminist and she taught me to see Until we all have justice, not Which one of us is on? free Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Title VII don't protect me from the pay inequality I work for the man each day, but the man Which don't work for me on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? I don't need those corporations Which sucking on my on? tip. A little socialism don't scare me one bit. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks Hi. for coming to talk to us today. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, Suzanne, you're a nurse at Bay State Franklin. Mm -hmm. And what kind of nursing do you do? And also, what's your role at, in the MNA, Mass Nurses Association? I am one of the staff nurses at Bay State Franklin Medical Center in the emergency department. And your role uh, on in the MNA is what? I know that you're on the negotiations team. Yep, I was on the negotiating team, and at that point, I was on the negotiating team as the union representative to the emergency department, and. Just about the time as we were ending our contract and getting a settlement, I became the junior co-chair of the bargaining unit. Great. And uh, speaking of which, congratulations on settling your contract. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's very was, exciting. Yep. We got a very good contract through a lot of hard work and, and negotiations. And part of uh, the, your proposals were sort of centered on a safe staffing. Mm -hmm. Right, a patient to nurse or nurse to patient ratio. Right. And this is sort of the topic of this ballot question it is, is is what makes you know what makes for safe uh, staffing what mm -hmm. makes for uh, safety in patient care in the hospital and so uh, the whole uh, title safe patient limit seems to be easy right pretty you straightforward know? I mean kind of straightforward we yep, all want to feel safe in the hospital so yep. what what's the problem what's the rub what's the issue around the ballot question well, to backtrack a little and, and give a little backfill, sure. because we refer to our, our contract. So in the time that we were settling our contract, for the bulk of that time, we had a new hospital president. And we staff nurses noticed that people left for a variety of reasons. Some people were seeking jobs elsewhere. Some people had children, and so they left. And those st staff people were not being replaced. So it seemed like there was sort of an unofficial, unannounced hiring freeze. And that, was mean, that meant that sometimes departments ran short. Sometimes um, they were just relying on the other staff to pick up time, making the assumption that we would fill in the gaps. And that really then can speak to what's happening on a state level and on a national level, that there just aren't enough nurses to care for patients. Patients who come into the hospital are sicker than they used to be. People stay in the hospital for shorter amounts of time as sort of the insurance healthcare industry relies more on nursing care in nursing homes and other outpatient services. Sure. When someone does come into the hospital, they tend to be much sicker, which means they need even more care. And since we settled our contract, we've seen what we would love to see, again, in other hospitals in the state, more nurses being hired. They hired 20 new nurses at the settlement of our contract. We're only a nursing body of 200 nurses. They hired an extra 10% because there was a need. There was a need. They doubled the size of the float pool and they increased nurses in almost every department. 
And so why, why is it that people are sicker when they're, they're coming into the hospital? Is it because the poverty levels are increasing? What, why are they sicker when it, they're coming into the hospital? What's, what changed over the years in terms of, of, of the uh, nurse and patient ratio? Well, in insurance companies have play a big role here. Insurance companies can deny care. Insurance companies sure. sometimes will um, refuse to pay a patient's bill if it's deemed that they could have been cared for in an outpatient setting. There's and just other options have opened up as there's more home-based nursing care in the form of visiting nurses. There's more care available um, at a nursing home or other kinds of outpatient settings. Okay. So it's become a much more financially imbalanced way of caring for people. So it seems to be untenable and part of what's mm -hmm. untenable is having uh, a number of patients per uh, nurse. Yes. And what's it like for you as an ER? Like tell me sort of a little bit uh, about, give me an example in your everyday life of how it's difficult mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how many patients you have to care for. I mean, take me to the scene yep. in, in, yep. in the emergency room. Yep. So um, we're a 20 bed emergency department. When we're running at full staff, which is um, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. So we have different levels of staffing depending on the time of day, and that's based on the average amount of patients that we may have during different times of day. There's generally less need for nurses at 3 o'clock in the morning as there is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Gotcha. So I have a four-patient assignment, typically, and that's for whatever kind of care the patients need, whatever kind of, whatever age, whatever kind of past medical history the patients have. And so then patients come into the hospital, we do an assessment, and at the end our goal is the patient leaves the emergency department because either they're well enough to go home or the patient needs to be admitted to a hospital, us or a higher level of care. We're a community hospital. Or maybe they're gonna go from us to a nursing home. But if they're gonna leave us, our department, and go stay in the hospital, then they're gonna go to another nurse on another unit that also has a patient assignment. If that nurse, and this is where the staffing bill really comes into play. I see. So that staffing bill is really very much directly addressing patients who are inpatient, who are staying overnight in the hospital. That nurse also has a lot of responsibility. You have someone coming into the hospital with a brand new diagnosis. The patient has a lot of questions. The family has a lot of questions. Even if it's continuing care for a known diagnosis that has now gotten worse. For instance, someone with congestive heart failure and medications aren't, aren't giving them enough help, they're getting worse. Maybe they got pneumonia on top of having congestive heart failure. They need education, they need medications, they need guidance, they need a lot of treatments. It's pretty hard as a nurse to juggle all of that and give the patient exactly what the patient and family needs and have a heavy assignment having to help other people who also have all of those needs. So you could have like four critical folks come in and mm -hmm. you could have a, a, a very large family for any one patient. And then you have to sort of triage, I'm guessing here, I think that you, know, you, you probably have to uh, triage all of the care that that patient will need when they come in and they're admitted, like do they need a nutritionist, do they need a social worker, right. do they need, so you have to triage all of that on top of being direct contact with the patient yep. when the patient comes in. Yep. So it, it depends on, on, uh, on the, the level of care. I, what I hear you say mm -hmm. is it depends on the level of care. Right. So, you, so I understand then from what you're saying that um, it would be important to have um, a significant number of nurses on staff you know, in, in the event that you get a number of critical um, patients that come in. Otherwise, two or three other patients may not get the kind of care that they should get because your focus may be on one that's more critical than the others, right, correct? Right. So, you, so you bring up critical care. We have an ICU, mm -hmm. an intensive care unit, and there is a safe staffing law in place already in Massachusetts regarding ICU level of care. And the way that works, as in, a, in a nutshell, is an ICU nurse can have one patient or two patients, but never more than that. And there's what we call an acuity tool, which is a chart that we look at, looking at how many different kinds of medications in how many different IVs, how much nursing care does this patient need? A patient qualifies for the ICU pretty much because 
that patient needs one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two right. nursing care. Needs so much nursing attention that the nurse can't care for other people as well because this person is critically ill and needs to have that level of care that you get with a nurse who's dedicated to just your care. So the ratio has to be smaller. Ratio has to be, has to be smaller. Right, got it. So we already have that law in place and it's really making a big difference in the kind of care patients get. It's a much safer environment for those patients. And really, at the end of the day, we all want to be safe. The nurse wants to be safe. Right. The patient wants to be safe. Wants and the family wants to know right. that there is good care going on because the nurse, A, isn't exhausted, and B, has the time to pay attention to what the patient and family needs. And that may change, I would imagine, during yeah, the course it, of their stay. Right, it's in flux. Depends and that's that, why people right. then are stepped down to the regular inpatient unit from the ICU. Someone comes in, they're in the ICU, right. they need really intensive care. Well now the infection is getting better, for instance, and the patient is kind of out of the woods and into a better spot mm -hmm. and then can go to the regular unit and have one nurse caring for four or five patients. Gotcha. So there's that sort of process right. uh, and it's a tiered process you right. start at one level and yep. then you may go to a different level so talk to me about um, other states that have instituted safe patient limits California similar. California what, what California. You know, that's the state that I heard about but mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about it it seems like uh, the the findings are that the mortality rate something about the mortality rate yep. changes goes down what, yep yep the mortality the mortality rate goes down patients readmission rate goes down and that is going to save money if patients are readmitted to the hospital within a certain amount of time, and forgive me, I don't know the exact amount of time, but you know, this is all insurance regulated. If patients are readmitted to the hospital within a short amount of time for the same diagnosis, or sometimes for a different but related or even slightly unrelated diagnosis, the hospital does not get paid for that second stay gotcha. by Medicare, Medicaid. And like a lot of hospitals, our hospital cares for a lot of patients who get Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. And so the, when the rate of admission, readmission is up, the hospital is losing money. We argue that if you have enough staff, you give patients the right amount of care, not only is it better for the patients, not only is it better for the nurse, but it's better for the financial bottom line of the hospital itself. So um, in the settlement of your contract, part of what uh, correct me if I'm wrong, part of what I, I remember reading what was agreed to was that the hospital w would adhere to uh, uh, the concept of, of, of safe staffing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but at the same time, hospitals are saying, well, if this ballot question goes through, we're going to have to hire a certain number of, of, of nurses. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is going to hit our, uh, our bottom line. So it was interesting that um, I read an article um, I think it was Mass Live, and I sort of have a little bit of a copy here about um, w what the uh, what the hospitals are actually profiting. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what you know about that, but it, it seems just from this one article um, that hospitals have certainly not done that badly. They've not um, done that badly, no. Right. <laughs> and no, so and they so, are not doing badly. The hospital is doing just fine, which is why you c they can afford to pay their CEO so much money, and right. which is why they have so much stocked away in the Cayman Islands, which is why they have... Stocked away in the Cayman Islands, yeah, that's they interesting. Yeah, Cayman Islands accounts. This is why they have um, the 14 highest earners in Bay State system. I th think the number is 7 million. I'm not going to remember those numbers right now, but that was part of our... Part of our campaign was that, because we were looking specifically, part of our campaign to get a contract, because we were looking specifically at Bay State, because that's who we were trying to get a contract right. with. Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Bay State Health owns. Health Systems? Yeah, Bay right. State Health Systems owns our hospital as right. well as other hospitals. So they're a for-profit prof institution. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, again, I'm still learning about this like a lot of voters are mm -hmm. learning about this, um, but um, it's my understanding that, that the uh, Bay State Franklin Medical Center, for example, doesn't pay property taxes because, is that correct? Right. So, th right. so there's and not, not the only that hospital other... in the state that doesn't pay property right. taxes. So there's not, there's not that added expense to hospitals. So, so, right. th so the profits that they're, that they're, that they're seeing are, are, are sort of real. Mm -hmm. um, and the uptick in illnesses are also real, right? right? And so um, 
tell me a, a little bit about how you're responding to hospitals uh, who are saying this is going to cost us a lot of money. Well, as, as I just said, we argue that it's going to save you money. Right. Because you're going to have lower readmission rates. So I have some percentages here. Um, this is about the wait times, which we can talk about. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk but, about the wait times. I mean, that's yeah. interesting because I can tell you from personal experience. Well, actually, can we just stick, yeah, to, sure, stick to, the, no, to, the, for it. to the money bit for Money's a moment? Important. So, um, between 1991 and 2014, California's annual health care costs grew by 4.6%, which is below the national average, mm -hmm. while here in this state, sorry, it grew by 5.2%, which is above the national average. And um, we argue that you know, having to readmit patients to the hospital when if they'd gotten the good care that they right. needed to begin with because right. they had enough nursing care. Right. Then it would cost them less money. The readmission rate is really crucial because that really, not only is it a strain on the family, does it mean the patient didn't really get what the patient needed, got sicker, right. but also the, the hospital is not going to get paid for that second admission. Yeah. Each admission costs yeah. right. quite a lot of money. Right. And so. so um, in 2014, the average Medicare payment per enrollee in the U.S. was 5,736, and the Massachusetts average was 30 percent higher. Massachusetts, we pay a lot more for health care, 7,458. Um, Massachusetts is one of the highest health care costs in the state, in the country, because of that. We also have much longer wait times in the emergency room mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, and that's partly because there's times when a patient needs to be admitted to the hospital, but there isn't space upstairs for them because they don't have enough staff. They don't have enough nurses mm -hmm. to care for these patients. And so then that, it's a trickle down. Right. Someone's in the, in the ER. That makes sense. It's determined they need to stay in the hospital. Right. They can't go to the hospital. Well, now they're still in that ER bed. Right. And the people in the lobby can't come in and be seen because there's just physically not room, but also, you know, I can only care for so many patients at once on an emergency basis. Right. So say, what changes for me? Let's say question one passes mm -hmm. in November. Um, first of all, when will it be implemented? Uh, if it passes in November, uh, when does it go into effect? And how does it go into effect, in other words? So it passes in November. Mm -hmm. Does that mean instantly that, nurse, that sorry, uh, hospitals are mandated to hire a certain amount of nurses? Well, they... Right away. R yes. Okay, so right to, away it will. Right. Okay. I think it's January 1st of 2019, okay. the law starts to roll into effect. Okay. And so, yeah, they'll need to start hiring nurses, and there's plenty of nurses that can be hired. Looking I know work. nurses who are leaving the hospital who told me they're leaving because they just can't do it anymore. Right. It's just, it's too exhausting. Right. They can get better nursing jobs in other kinds of environments, like a doctor's office, because it's just, it's just too stressful and too straining having such a heavy patient assignment all the time. So and it's scary. We, so, we have people's lives yeah, in our hands. Yeah. We want to be able to give them the resources that they need to be able to do well. That's the right. goal, is you come in the hospital to get well and go home and carry on your life as best as you medically can. Right. So it goes into effect January 1. I'm a patient. I come into the emergency room, mm -hmm. and I've got, you know, whatever, I've got a cut, <laughs> and I have to wait in the emergency room. Actually, this is real, a real story. Oh. You know, I had, my cat bit me. Oh. I go into the emergency room. I wait three hours, which is really what happened. I yep. wait three hours. What happens on January 1 to me in the same situation? I go into the emergency, emergency room. I get a cat bite. Yep. Uh, do I wait three hours or do I wait uh, an hour and a half? Or um, am I assured when I come in, I'm going to have at least a lot less wait time? What sort of changes for me as a patient? Less wait time in the ER. That's our goal. And, and it's, as again, it's said, it's a trickle-down effect. Yeah. So ideally, we get enough nurses on the inpatient unit caring for right. people, so then people roll from the nursing, from the um, emergency department, right to the inpatient unit. That right. all happens sooner, and then you then have a space to come in and be treated. And does it also extend to discharge? 
Yeah, once you're once you're right. once you're in. Once you're in and you're you've being seen treated. a doctor. Right. Then as far as getting discharged, that means that your tests have come back, your doctor's talked to you, your doctor's discharged right. you, your nurse has been able to get in there into the room with your discharge papers mm -hmm. and sit down and take a moment to educate about what you what you're going to be doing for outpatient care. So using your cat bite analogy, you're going to be on antibiotics. You're going to be watching for signs of further infection. Right. I can't just hand you papers happen. and say, here, take your stuff, right. bye. I can sit down and say, here's your Bactrim. You're going to take it every 12 hours. Please take it, on, pl please take it as you should, and mm -hmm. here's why. Mm -hmm. Please finish it, mm -hmm. and here's why. Mm -hmm. Here's what you're going to watch for to make sure that the injury, the cut, the bite is healing well. And here's why you're going to come back and seek more medical care. So, so overall, without that, you run the risk of going with your cat, cat bite analogy. If someone just says, here's your papers, I got to go, good luck, then you may look and say, oh, the prescription says take back to them twice a day. Well, I'll take it with my breakfast and I'll take it in the afternoon. I'll take it every six hours. That'll be good enough, right? That's two times a day. You didn't get the education. No, twice a day means every 12 hours. 12 hours, not, yeah. You, and it's like, oh, okay, I have a bite. Now I'm taking this medicine. I'll be fine, I'm off on my way, and you're not told, if it gets red, swollen, hard, there's a red line going up from it, you need to come in and seek medical care again. You just say, oh, I'm taking medicine, it must be fine. Mm -hmm. And then, you, then someone looks at it a week later and says, wow, that looks really nasty, now you come in. Well now, because you weren't given the education, you need IV antibiotics, and you have to stay in the hospital for a couple of days to get that higher, stronger dose of antibiotics. Gotcha. So it's, it's, it's from start to finish. Mm -hmm. It's faster one-on-one uh, -on -one care. Right. And it's more comprehensive one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one care. And it starts from the moment you walk into the emergency room through whether or not you're admitted or not. Right. Uh, and it's in it, the way I see it as a voter, uh, it, is, it, um, it is from infancy all the way until end of life, yeah. right? Because, I mean, in my industry, it's public education. We start pre-K pre and then we end it right. <laughs> at 12th right. grade. But, you know, we're talking about everyone uh, in oh, our yeah. society. Oh, yeah, and that's, that's why hospitals have beautiful right. birthing centers. Right. Because you're, so birth not only is the first medical encounter for the infant, but it's when a lot of young adults who generally tend to be healthy people, those people who are having babies, that's often the first encounter as an adult with a hospital system. Right. And so the hospital systems have figured out, give really, really beautiful, good care right. in these lovely facilities at that, for that population, because that's the population who's going to be staying. Now you have a, a very small child, that baby may need care later. Need care. Right. You know, falls down, skins a knee, jumps off the swing set, breaks an arm, right. has a high fever for the first time as a as a infant. Patients going families are going to bring the child to where they got the care to begin with. Right. We are looking at lifelong care when we're caring for people. Now your grandmother needs some attention because she's just not breathing right. You're going to go to the place where you gave birth because you had a very good encounter at that point. You had the right kind of care. You're going to come back there. And how are or conversely, yeah. you felt rushed. Mm -hmm. You left there a little confused about what you're supposed to do. You don't really know where to go forward. Well, maybe you're going to go to another hospital. And how are hospitals preparing for this right now? How well, would, right now they're preparing for this by pushing back as much as they can to not have it so happen. So what about new hires now? Because obviously people are leaving now and they do hire new people. So mm -hmm. what's happening with new hires now? How are the hospitals responding I can I can tell you what my hospital is doing. That's I work great. for Bay State Franklin Medical Center. Yes. And this is, you know, there's the, the other context of we just got a contract. So they are hiring, as I said, 20 new nurses in every department or in a lot of the departments. They've been hiring new people. Um, because we have this contract saying that they're going to hire to fill the staffing needs of the hospital. So they're already, they're already sort of putting this they are already ballot doing question, it. which has not yeah. even been presented to the voters yet in right. November. Um, they're, they're, putting, uh, um, they're putting new nurses and, and they are, they're upping the, the ratio, or they're mm -hmm. lowering the ratio as we speak mm -hmm. now. The other interesting piece that happened with our contract is we had proposed hire to fill your, your contractual obligation. Mm -hmm. so, you, so all hospitals in all departments have a staffing grid. 
here's how many, so in the mental health unit, for example, when you have this many patients, you need this many nurses, and you need this many mental health counselors who are support staff. Right. Sort of a CNA of the mental health world. You have these grids for every department. In the emergency department, our grid is based on time of day. In the medical surgical unit, the grid is based on patient population. So you already have these grids. Hire to fill those grids that right. you can run this 24-hour ship. So and so they, they agreed to it. And we mm -hmm. said, we pointed out to them that the ballot initiative specifically says that the language of the new law will not supersede a union contract law. And we were interested to see that the hospital still wanted the contract to say that they will meet all legal obligations. Mm -hmm. So they put a contract in effect that's going to be in effect past when this law started. Right. But they still said, we will comply with any new laws that are about staffing. We thought that was that's, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. It'd be it's interesting very good. to see how that. It's very good moves along. Yeah, you know, at the um, end of the day, Mary Ellen, yeah. the nurses and the hospital administrators have the same goal. We want to be the best hospital right. we can be. For a while, Bay State had a banner out front saying that they're one of the top 100 rural hospitals. We want that to be true, not just for how much money you make, mm -hmm. but for the kind of care you provide, the low readmission rate to the hospital that you can say that you have, and the great patient satisfaction that you have. And patients, one of the patient's number one satisfaction goals in the you know, list is my nurse had a, enough time to take care of me. I have heard of patients saying to the case manager, so everyone's seen by a case manager, everyone's assessed for case management needs. I've had heard of patients' families saying, can someone please shave my dad? He's been in the hospital five days and no one has shaved him. He, my 89-year-old father, who's very, a very proud man, always shaves every day. So and it's no about one's given him that service. Yeah, and it's Can about, someone yeah. please brush my mother's teeth? Yeah. It's, it's, it's basic care that if you, know, if you have just one or two CNAs per patient, I mean per, per unit of 16 people, mm -hmm. you don't have enough nurses, patients aren't getting that kind of basic care and we want to see them get that basic care. So obviously you want voters to vote yes mm -hmm. on question one. Yep, it's really, uh, because, it's key. Right, it's key, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it means long-term care, meaning not only for one person, but for the community. Mm -hmm. So um, I appreciate your coming. Thank um, you. And I appreciate all your, the work that you're, you do as a nurse and as you know, you're doing on, at your side job, which is yeah. on question one campaign. Yeah. So thank you. Thank Thanks you so for much. having us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. This was Democracy Here! And our guest today was Suzanne Love from the Massachusetts Nurses Association. And we talked about ballot question one, safe patient limits. Thank you, you all for my watching. Sisters, which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Come all you northern liberals Taking clansmen out to dine The time has come to choose a side And join the picket line Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? My father was a carpenter, now he's with the air and sun. But he'll be with his fellow workers till the battle's won. Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? They say in Milwaukee, cleansed by Great Lake you water, you'll either be a union man or a thug or skywalker. Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my sisters? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my 